Welcome to What If So What, the podcast where we ask what's possible with digital and figure out how to make it real in your business. I'm Jim Hertzfeld. And I'm Kim Chopek. We're part of Proficient's digital strategy team, and today we'll ask what if, so what, and most importantly, now what? Hey, Jim, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, Kim. Welcome back yourself. It's great to be here. Really looking forward to a new idea that we've, uh, we're have uncovering this round. Yes, yes. So for those who haven't listened to our podcasts before, or if this is your first time here, uh, just a reminder, we have out there two big story arcs. One kind of covers what is digital, what does it mean to your business, and kind of our big so what, what do you do with digital? And then just strategy in general. What is strategy? How do you apply it to the business? How has that evolved? And again, so what? Strategy. And this uh, new season, the story arc, we have a whole new idea. Yeah, Kim, it's kind of, it is a new idea, a new a new arc, kind of an old idea as well. It's around innovation. And I think, you know, as we've talked about these words that get used a lot, right? They, they sort of get overused in some ways and they have a lot of a lot of interpretation. I think we felt personally that we need to kind of settle down and unpack it and figure out what it really means and maybe why it has this meaning, but why why it has value, right? What is it? What's the what if the the so what and the now what? We're going to cover that again today. So let's go into a, a little more detail and a, a little more perspective on on why innovation is important, why why it's a white noise word, and why we wanted to cover it. Right. So just like our previous episodes, when we kind of dove into disambiguating digital and strategy, we want to do the same thing with this white noise word innovation. And I think in the preparation for this first episode, it was a little triggering for me. It's a word that I truly hate because I I think it gets thrown around. People are held to very high standards to innovate. And time after time, you see failures. And why is that? And and my my personal opinion is people just don't know what it means. They don't know how to operationalize it. They don't know how to measure it. And they don't understand how innovation can come from different parts of the business and can be measured in different ways. So, you know, many interpretations and certainly many academically defined components. But what I want to answer this season is what is innovation? What does it mean to digital? What does it mean to digital strategy? Is it a process? Is it an outcome? How do you know if X, you know, product, service, business model really is innovative? And I mean, we've both seen a lot of this hype, right? We see a lot of hype, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of hype, a lot of like what's new and exciting, you know, and when I'm thinking about this in terms of a good innovation, uh, and this is debatable, of course, but a good innovation, something that I think truly was innovative in hindsight is the iPhone, classic example. You know, Clay Shirky, who wrote Cognitive Surplus, he talks about how new technology drives new behavior, drives new technology, drives new behavior. We've certainly seen that in the mobile phone space. So I, in my mind, I think that's an innovation that truly lived up to the hype. Something that I think was very hyped and ultimately kind of went nowhere, if if you recall, the Segway. That was supposed to revolutionize personal transportation. And I think the most I've seen of the Segway are the lakefront tours I've seen here in Chicago. Yeah, And then, of course, you have uh, the vaporware innovations. I think most of us have heard the Theranos story at this point, an innovation that just really never came to fruition and disappointed a lot of people to say the least. So Kim, um, that is a Theranos is a sort of a trigger word for me. If if anybody doesn't (laughs) know that story, I think HBO documentary, there's a great CBS podcast series on it. There's just so much drama behind it. I mean, it's a classic drama story as much as it is uh, an innovation tale, you know? And I I think um, that was like a great idea, just like the Star Trek tricorder was a great idea, right? But just, you know, in the 60s, and it took 50 years to make that happen. Like, they think, you know, Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes were were, now, were they deceiving us or did they really believe that they were going to make an innovation? They were going to make a breakthrough. Sorry, back to the Segway. I do think Segway was a great innovation <laughs> for tourists. 
So or tourists. We'll, we'll leave, we'll leave, we we'll leave it at that. That's right. Yeah, but those are those are great hypes. I think I go back to um, New Coke. If anybody remembers, this is kind of an old one back in the eighties. I remember when it when they announced that, I immediately got a bottle. Yes, there were bottles, glass bottles of old Coke, and tucked it away because I thought it was going to be worth something someday. But <laughs> you know, of course, that that failed, and Coke Classic I think came back, but. That's an interesting one too, because the flaw there, was there really a demand for that? Or I think the motivation was to try and be more like the competition and certainly went went south. My favorite sort of failed innovation, and I, I don't know how innovative it really was, and I'd never heard of this, was Colgate lasagna. I This was shocking. This was a yeah. shocking revelation uh-huh. to me. <laughs> and so the first thing that came to your mind, I think, was what's the innovation? Was it a lasagna flavored toothpaste or was it, you know, toothpaste flavored lasagna? That's where I went. But needless to say, it it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't it, it failed. That's probably more of a brand failure as, a, as a, but it was kind of rolled out as an innovation. But I give look, I give people and organizations a lot of credit for trying and experimenting. I think we'll get into this later. I think that's a really valuable part of innovation is is learning from from failures. In fact, I think failure and experimentation We'll get into this later. Is a, is a is a critical part, you know. So it's, you know, maybe it's not fair to Monday morning quarterback, you know, some of these failures. But there are some myths out there, right? There are some yes. preconceived ideas about you know this word innovation. You had a few of them on your mind. Yeah, the connotation of innovation is what drives me crazy. So this notion of the Moses myth that we call it, where, you know, every and every big disruption has to be led by a godlike innovator. Steve Jobs comes to mind here. He certainly was seen as a, as a, a true innovator, but I think we've seen now a little bit behind the scenes that maybe how he treated his, his employees wasn't ideal. And, you know, there there were a lot of uh, flaws, perhaps people would say, in, in, in how he ran that company, even though the products ended up being innovative. There's also this myth that innovation equals technology. And I think in the space of digital, we do look at technology a lot to help us drive innovations. Uh, but it doesn't have to be driven by technology and we'll kind of explore that. And then that notion that innovation must be a big bang, it must be disruptive. That's really a myth. You know, innovation comes from all parts of the business and there's different ways to think about how innovation gets rolled out. It does not have to always be disruptive. Clayton Christensen's Innovator's Dilemma comes to mind where a lot of companies fail is they don't know how to really operationalize innovation. And even though they're doing everything right, they're still not able to, quote unquote, innovate. Kodak is a good example of that. How do we actually measure and structure quote unquote innovation so it can be sustainable and it kind of fits with the business strategy or is it the business strategy that needs to change? So lots of uh, myths and misinformation and uh, ambiguity around innovation that really stresses people out. So Jim, what do you think innovation is? Myth, ambiguity, misinformation. It it sounds like social media, Kim. Um, (laughs) So an innovation that has proved yeah. to be perhaps detrimental. Maybe so, maybe so. Unlike podcasting, where we figure it all out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, Kim, I think um, you know that setup is accurate. You know, the, there's the, the, the hype, the misinformation, the excitement. You know, that's something we really didn't mention of innovation. You know, it's a it is a big draw. But I think uh, you know, we've we've thought a lot about this because, of course, we, we hear about it. We we want to have a point of view. We want to be have a practical point of view. And I think it comes down to first sort of d- defining what an innovation is, what an innovation process is in terms of w- what are the characteristics? Because it, it can be so many things. You, know, you have to sort of break it down into its parts, make sure you sort of satisfy the audience here. I, you know, We've settled on really one definition, I think the most simplistic definition, something we can get our heads around that really describes some core characteristics. But I, I think there are also some subtle elements that I'll get into, but when we talk about the definition that, that really gets to these key characteristics, I think it's two parts. One, it's it's something new to your business. Secondly, it satisfies an unmet customer need, and I'll add on to that a business problem. So something new to your business that satisfies an, an unmet need or a business problem. 
know, if we break that down, the, the, the newness, I think that's, that's something we hear a lot about. I think that's obvious. We'll kind of get into some more subtle parts of that, but new is kind of easy to identify, right? It hasn't been done, hasn't been done this way, haven't seen it before, didn't exist until our, our design session. There's a, a scenario that we're working on with a customer today. It's a very, uh, it's, it's a industrial product. You know, it's distributed to the field today. They go out to job sites, to farms. They are on a, tr- a route. This is a kind of a model that's been going on forever. They take and deliver orders, right? Happens on a pretty routine basis. And, you know, the new idea is what if we, you know, what if we ordered that on demand from a mobile experience? Now, Mobile experience is not new, but it's new to this application. But does it meet the unmet need? It's sort of the second characteristic. To understand that need, you really have to have something we've talked about forever, which is empathy. Do I understand the day in the life of that customer, that user, that that ranch hand, that business owner, that procurement officer? You know, they've got a day job to do. They're not there to be enamored by your mobile app. Right. If you examine that novel idea, new idea about taking the order, is it really something that they need to do? And that needs some expo- exploration. If all that works, great. You know, we've, we've, we've got an innovation on our hands. But I think, you know, those two really key characteristics, I think, jump out right away. And I think I, there are things that, that people can kind of get their heads around. But I think there are some subtle elements as well. I think, I think of three things. One, could you solve a problem that users didn't know that they had? And I'll go back to this classic quote. It's attributed to Henry Ford. If I'd given people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses or if he had asked them. So this is a case where they didn't even know there was an option. You know, they didn't know there was a possibility. And, you know, I think this is why technology is so, it's so exciting to people because like, you know, th- th- it, there's got to be a, a, a problem that this can solve. And, and often there is, but again, it's it, without that empathy and not, without understanding the problem it may not scale, it may not convert, you know, it may not transfer. So, and I think back to Henry Ford and you think about what people wanted, he didn't know it, but a lot of the automotives today, they're not trying to innovate on the vehicle. They're not trying to innovate on things with four wheels. They're really focusing on mobility, right? How do I get people from A to B? So in the, in the era of ride sharing and autonomous vehicles, you know, that equation changes quite a bit. Right. So what else, you know, what are problems they didn't know they had? Those are great elements of an, of an innovation. I think the second thing we'll talk about is scalability. Like, can it grow? Does, can it go somewhere? The one that comes to mind, I know we, we had fun with this is the, and there aren't a lot of these is the pizza ATM. <laughs> yes. I, I love this innovation for so many reasons, mostly because I love pizza. But, um, you know, this was, I think it started at, at Xavier University in Cincinnati. It's kind of spread a little bit, but it is literally a robotic pizza kitchen behind an ATM type of interface behind the wall. So frozen pizza is, it picks it up, you know, it puts the toppings on it, it cooks it, spits it out. Uh, it's pretty cool, you know, at 3 a.m. But, you know, can that scale? I, I think it's a viable business, but I, I, that's the first thing I think of is like, man, how do you get that many pizza, frozen pizzas, you know, in, in the right places at the right, right time? That's a good visual. But, you know, things, it has to work. It has to grow with the business. It has to meet the demand. It has, it has to continue to work. You know, some things work once. Hey, this is a great model, but is it reliable in the field? And there's all kinds of stories about, you know, back to cars that, perform well, but break down every month. The difference between what's an innovation and what's just a novelty or kitschy or, you know, it's, it's great for PR, but it can't be distributed. Yeah. It's great. It's great for the, the demo, right? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but then what? Right. So, you, you know, smoke and mirrors, you can do your Wizard of Oz analogies here. You know, it's gotta, it's gotta actually do something from a business perspective, but I think that the other couple of subtle elements that stand out to me is comes from the U.S. Patent Office. If you kind of unpack the definition of a patent, you know, there's obviously a lot of crossover to what's an innovation. They have two key words that I think come out again as we think about what makes a good innovation. And the one is novel, which is basically a fancy word for new. But the one I really liked was non-obvious. It's a little hard to handle, a little hard to tackle and interpret, but non-obvious means, is this something that once I see it, you know, it's not, it wasn't obvious the whole time. 
A good example I had is a patent that Google just got. Google just earned a patent on for putting a the front facing camera under the glass, under the screen. So now on your mobile phone, you have a little hole at the top of your phone. If that could just go under the screen, I could get a little bigger screen size. And so they figured out how to do that. You know, so that's the novel part. But what wasn't obvious was how we make that work with the LCD technology. And they figured that out. And, you know, so that that's really, really subtle part. And obviously, you know, there are patent lawyers that do a lot of that work. <laughs> um, but I thought that was an interesting element when we think about things that are innovative, because as the just sort of casual innovator, sometimes you can just kind of look at something and go, okay, what am I missing? What is not obvious? And I think that's a great way to start thinking about these things. It is. And I really like that example because nobody is necessarily asking for a better front facing camera. Maybe necessarily I'm thinking of the Henry Ford analogy. You know, no one was asking for a motorized vehicle. They were asking for faster horses. What are customers asking for here? Maybe sharper photography, maybe just the fact that they would like a front facing camera because for a variety of reasons, whatever the case is. Um, but I like this example because it really uh, underscores the type of innovation. It is innovative by definition. It's new, perhaps. It's non-obvious. It's meeting an unmet need. But it's not disruptive right now. It could end up being disruptive because we're not thinking about perhaps all the applications of a new front-facing camera. But it's not it's not something that you would necessarily think of as innovative. It's not this big bang. It's not a huge disruption. And I know like as we've talked about innovation now in the last 15 minutes, uh, it might sound like we're down on innovation. Like it's hard, it's complicated. We've given a definition. It's a definition, but how do you really apply it? So you might think, well, what's the value of innovation in general? A lot of pressure to innovate, but what's the real business value? And some of that might seem obvious. So, you know, there's lots of different innovation frameworks and strategy models that should lead you to tangible business outcomes. Um, and innovation is really at the core of those business outcomes. You know, back in the day, we, a lot of people would talk about blue ocean versus red ocean, and that's all well and good. But ultimately, a business innovates to differentiate to solve an unmet need, whether it's for the customer or their business model or employees, for example, to drive top line growth or profitability, to be competitive, and to deliver better value. So those are obvious reasons to innovate. That makes it sound easy. What really matters, though, I think, in the context of digital and digital strategy is solving that customer or business or an employee problem, leveraging digital in new, scalable, perhaps unexpected or non-obvious ways, right? That I think, Jim, would you agree? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I thought I thought your answer was just going to be pizza. I thought that was the obvious reason why, but um, <laughs> I'm still stuck on that probably because it's lunchtime. Well, those are great grounding reasons, Kim, you know, and I think that's why everyone's is interested, right? And we're certainly not, we're not down on innovation at all. Maybe what we're saying here is you've got to be focused, right? You've got to really narrow what customer problems you're trying to solve. And then, and then to your point, why, why does it matter to the business? And I think that loop, and we heard a lot of this from Andy Hunt a few episodes ago at Hershey, it's really tying those, those things together. So because there's so much hype, because there's so much pressure, we struggle with just exactly how to do it. So that kind of takes us to the now what, Kim? So, so how do we, how do we do this? How do we innovate? How do we, how's the, how's the casual innovator become the expert innovator? Right. And even that is a little triggering to me because, you know, I'm a structure gal. So when people say you need to innovate, I, my first question is, well, how are you going to do that? And I, there are a lot of different ways to think about how you innovate. So I think the first thing is to decide what parts of the organization are due for innovation. And, and that generally should align with your overall business strategy. But again, maybe your business strategy is what needs to be innovated on. But just as an example, there's Doblin's, you know, 10 types of, of innovation. So it looks at, you know, is it a product that needs to be innovated on? Is it a service? Is it an experience? Is it the actual organizational structure? Is it the business model? There are lots of types of innovations within an organization. And I think a major misconception is it always has to be a product or a service, but that's not the case. So, and driven by technology. 
Right, right, right. So thinking about what parts of the organization do you want to innovate on? And then once you decide on that, again, it doesn't all have to be a big bang. You want to decide how you want to innovate, basically, what process will you apply to the innovation? Uh, The structure and the process of the areas of the business will operationalize that innovation. So again, um, it need not all be a big bang, especially if the business strategy and organizational structure won't support (laughs) what that kind of approach demands. So we think about kind of this four quadrants of innovation that talks to the process and how you operationalize. So we look at incremental innovation, disruptive is still in there, of course, sustaining innovation or radical innovation. And these each have definitions, but sustaining innovation, Nike is a good example here where they innovate on new products over time. So yeah, you could say a shoe is a shoe is a shoe, but what I like about the Nike organization and their overall model of sustaining innovation is it's not just the product. They're innovating in their supply chain model. They're innovating in material sustainability. They're innovating in some of their recycling They're innovating in a lot of their uh, organizational structure when it comes to diversity and inclusion efforts. So they really have a nice sustaining innovation model as an organization. Something disruptive, though, like truly new, that's, uh, I won't say it's a big bang, but it certainly solved an unmet customer need, a huge pain point, is a company like Carvana, who came on the scene and said, nope, you can sit at home and browse vehicles, buy your vehicle online, and we will deliver it to you. And that was truly disruptive. And a lot of um, OEMs right now are really struggling to catch up and tilting their business model on their heads because, you know, new technology. Technology drives new behavior, and we're seeing that in the in the auto market. Something that's a little more radical, radical innovation where we're using technologies in new and different ways is Tesla. Well, they didn't invent the car, um, but they really revolutionized and innovated on the electric vehicle market in ways that no other automotive manufacturer could. And and this is going to maybe be a little bit controversial, but in terms of an incremental innovative company, I'm going to say Apple. You know, maybe the iPhone was a big bang and they've innovated on new products that were disruptive to the market. But what new innovative product have they brought to the market lately in terms of consumer hardware? I would say none. They are just continue to innovate in the products they already have through software releases and updates and and so on and so forth. MacBook Air (laughs) is an example of maybe a failed uh, product innovation. But I I like those. I like the when you layer. Yeah. (laughs) I like when you layer on, you know, what parts of the business decide on that and then decide how you're going to structure and measure the success of those innovations. And then I think when it comes down to brass tacks, you have to fund it. Innovation doesn't come for free. You can't just rely on, you know, a bunch of developers at a hackathon really driving an innovation to the business. You need to budget for it. You need to measure that budget. You need to allocate that budget. You need to track that budget. And that's kind of how I feel like you really know how an innovation is successful, at least based on your initial plans. What do you think, Jim? Oh my gosh, Kim, there's so much there. First of all, what happened to hackathons? They were, they, it's like, I think there was a hackathon. <laughs> Gosh, we're going back 10 years. I felt like every other week there was some hackathon going on around me, but um, yeah, I guess they didn't really work out. No, I think those are all great techniques. Um, I had a couple of others that I, that I would add, and these are going to be, you know, a little bit of a throwback, maybe a little bit of overlap, but I think another one is, is again, staying connected to customers. Talked about empathy again and again and again. We we talked about in our definition solving an unmet need. You really have to understand what those needs are. You know, I love this this visual about design where the statue is in the block of marble. The artist is just finding it. Right, they're chipping right. away the outside of it, right, to reveal the statue. It's not really how it works, but the metaphor is the same. You know, if you really when you understand your customers, you'll understand what their needs are. Now you're focusing on the correct innovations. And one of the things that I learned early on, I'll go do a couple throwbacks in, in my career. You know, we were very focused early on with continuous improvement and understanding what was happening on the shop floor or in the field or in the customer's, you know, home. 
And uh, I think those things all still are, are, are still valuable. What's great about digital is it gives us all these data points, right? And all these interactions that we can monitor and understand, you know, which is something we call journey science. And uh, it's going to be a more and more valuable part about building empathy. So I think you have to have that, you know, and, and it's, and it's not like someone else's job. It's everyone's job in the organization because every, everybody's part about, of that customer supply chain, that customer service delivery chain uh, along the way. And I'll go back when I, when I was a, I was a young engineer at Whirlpool. And one of the things that they would do is we had an alliance with Sears and to do service and we would ride the service truck. And you would get out there, get totally out of your element, ride with the service tech. You're going into seven or eight people's homes, literally their basements, their laundry rooms, and understanding what's wrong, how they use the product, what they think about it. And you might think, you know, it's an appliance, it's a washer, dryer, no big deal. But man, that is invaluable insight. So all kinds of things to learn by continuing to stay in touch with customers you know, back to it, something you said is like, how do we choose the right things to innovate? Having a process that isn't heavy, you know, it's not a big PMO, but, but there is a funnel. Again, Andy Hunt talked about this. You know, I don't think there's, sometimes I think there's no shortage of ideas. There's some challenges in picking the right ones. And, um, you know, the ones that are going to you know move the needle or much less innovate. And so I think having a process that, that is akin to a portfolio where we're balancing sustainable and disruptive innovations is really important. We have an approach we call Now New Next that encompasses that. We could spend a lot of time talking about, but it really gets into having to make some of these tough decisions. And I, we had a we had a uh, a decision with a it was a sportswear company, sort of a fan based sportswear company that was trying to make a decision between a really exciting mobile shopping experience and it's kind of fixing their omni-channel ordering problem, which is really not, not sexy, not disruptive, right? but it's really what they needed. It gets back and it goes again, it goes back to making, that's a tough decision. You know, we kind of proved out that there was an innovation there that would result in better loyalty, better service, you know, versus the other. So the, the shopping experience, which they ultimately did, you know, but I think having clear eyes and thinking about the decision process is important. One last thing I would add is this, you know, the idea of, of back to scalability, you know, are you building durability and resilience, you know, into this innovation? Is it productized? We hadn't talked about Netflix yet, Kim. I always, I think that's a great example actually of scalability in, 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 in an innovation. Yeah. Not, yes. Not from the content. I'm going back to early Netflix because the idea of shipping, you know, the, on paper, I'm going to, I don't know, call up a phone, a 1-800 number. And you're going to ship me a VHS cassette. Maybe that's how the idea would have worked uh, in the 80s. But yeah, it wasn't really scalable, right? Until the DVD, until online order and my, we're ordering and microservices came to fruition. You know, that's really to me what made that idea viable, right? Was that that scalability? So I don't know when they invented the idea, but it, you know, if it if it had come up in the 80s, it would be VHS tapes. Again, either way, a great idea on paper, but Great business model innovation, but not scalable until the, until the technology is there. Yeah. And I love the Netflix example. As you and I were talking about, we had very different ideas of what was truly innovative uh, from that company, uh, the business model innovation, no doubt. But I still think the microservices architecture innovation far exceeds the business model innovation. But that's hindsight 2020. It really is. I mean, we didn't, we, we're looking back at that now and how microservices and headless architecture has proliferated digital. That's hindsight 2020. Who knows that that would have been innovative when they were investing so much time and energy in building out that architecture. Now, but everybody looks at them as the banner example. And then they just assume I can stream a movie from anywhere I want. No big deal. Right. Which is just ubiquitous, right? Yep. Have you cut the cord, Kim? Oh, Maybe you didn't our, even install the cord. We cut our cord a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Well, Kim, I think we covered a lot of ground today. Um, there's probably lots more to talk about innovation, but uh, I hope we've really done the right work here and sort of breaking down what, what makes it important. I'm excited about weaving that into the next few episodes. Uh, we've got some great guests from 
uh, Optimizely and Capital One and Pegasystems, Unigroup, a few more I can't talk about yet, but we'll be asking them some tough questions and looking forward to doing that with you, Kim. Yeah, I I think we set a good foundation. Let's call it our hypotheses and we can uh, speak to all of our guests and see what they think about innovation and whether or not they feel the same pressure I do. But in general, uh, we want to work with them to help make sense of it, demystify it, and, and again, make it really practical to the business. And we will continue our theme here asking the one big question, how do we use this topic to truly drive innovation in the business? Asking that big, what if, so what, and most importantly, now what? Thanks, Kim. Talk to you soon, Jim. You've been listening to What If, So What, the digital strategy podcast from Proficient with Jim Hertzfeld and Kim Chopek. We want to thank our Proficient colleague, J.D. Norman, for our music today. Subscribe to the podcast and don't miss a single episode. You can find this season along with show notes at Proficient.com. Thanks for listening.